And now you're in for a real treat. Um, it's my privilege to introduce you to the chairman of our board and my good friend, Hank Brown. Hank grew up in California and Colorado, and he began his habit of overachieving as a kid. He attended the University of Colorado on a football scholarship. He was on the honor roll, and he served as student body president. Then he served our country in the Navy as a on a voluntary tour of Vietnam. After the military, he worked his way through law school at CU as a janitor and a salesman. I can't quite picture that, Hank, but <clears throat> I know that's what you've told me. He spent 10 years at Monfort of Colorado, which is a very large cattle feeding company where he served as vice president and general counsel. Then he went on and served four years as in the state senate, representing uh, what district? Four, did you say? Was it? 26, okay. Then he served four terms, which is eight years, representing Colorado in the U.S. House of Representatives, where he was um, on num a number of committees, but the one you'd be most interested in is the Ethics Committee. Now, while he was in Washington, D.C., serving all these committees and doing all these other things, he decided that the law degree wasn't quite enough. He wanted to go back to night school and get his CPA and understand tax law so he could do a better job in Washington. Don't you wish we had people like that in Washington today? <clears throat> After that, he served one year or one term or six years rep representing Colorado in the U.S. Senate. Then he went and served as president of the University of Northern Colorado, the Daniels Fund, and the University of Colorado. He has had an amazing career and a track record of service to this country. <clears throat> but above all, I would say to you that Hank is a man of the highest integrity. And it was that leadership and that integrity that Bill Daniels admired so much in Hank. Please join me in welcoming Hank Brown. Lynn is the most secure foundation president I know in her job with introductions like that. It is, <clears throat> it is quite true I've had a difficult time holding a job as we've gone forward. But each one of them has been a separate challenge and great fun. Greg, let me thank you for a, a marvelous job tonight in emceeing this operation and, and let you know how much we appreciate uh, your great work and, uh, and particularly the fact that you don't charge us for it. We, we, uh, you know, as you think about the marvelous events of today, you have to reflect on how absolutely delighted Bill Daniels would be with what you've done, with the people who volunteered their times in terms of coaching and judging, uh, and in terms of the fund, in terms of their sponsorship of this kind of endeavor. I can't think of anything that Bill would have enjoyed more or would have been prouder to have his name associated with. And he was quite careful with where he allowed his name to be used. But this, I suspect, would either be his favorite or certainly close to it. Well, I wanted to chat a little bit uh, about ethics and about uh, how they may apply to you, but I, I couldn't help but notice the activities of uh, the, the captain of that Italian luxury liner. Some of you may remember a, a month or so ago, the luxury liner uh, uh, cracked up on some rocks on the Italian coast. and. Uh, the captain of the ship, uh, rather than follow the old adage of going down with the ship, apparently left first. Um, it brought to mind a couple of things, you know, what you hope won't happen in the way of leadership, and also it brought to mind of a comment of Winston Churchill. Some of you may remember that Churchill, after uh, World War II, was defeated in his effort to be reelected. He was thought to be something of a hero, and so it was a surprise to people that he was defeated. And uh, freed from that responsibility, he uh, still served in Parliament, and as you know, went on to be a Prime Minister again in the 50s. But right after the war, when he was freed up, he and his wife, Clementine, took a, a, a tour of the Med, uh, took a Med cruise, if you will. And uh, they happened to take it on an Italian cruise liner. Um, and it was quite a thing. As you know, the, the, uh, the Europeans don't always 
have a lot of love for each other and that was particularly true after world war two when they were on different sides and so on and so it was a natural thing he was he was on the ship uh, the press came to him and uh, cornered him and uh, even though he was on a vacation and they said uh, prime minister why uh, why in the world would a british prime minister take a cruise on an italian cruise liner and churchill graciously said well they have uh, outstanding cuisine uh, uh, the service is magnificent and what's more with the italian cruise liners you don't have any of this nonsense uh, about women and children first should an unfortunate event happen <laughs> you went for you know, Churchill's such a wonderful source because he was uh, um, quite uh, quite uh, pointed sometimes when he'd have exchanges. One of them was with an American family that also was British, I guess, the Astors. Lord Astor uh, uh, had uh, been a member of the opposite party from Churchill, and his Lady Astor was uh, particularly hostile to Churchill, and he sometimes reciprocated, but at one party, she came up to him and she said, Winston, if you were my husband, I'd give you poison. He said, Lady Churchill, if I were your husband, I'd take it. <laughs> At a different party, she approached him and said, Winston, you're drunk. And indeed, he did imbibe to a great deal uh, at those receptions. And uh, Churchill acknowledged that, uh, that she was correct. Uh, he said, but um, you're ugly. <laughs> And the difference is that tomorrow morning, I'll be sober. Well, well, you're learning a lot about ethics, aren't you? That, uh, one last story I can't resist. George Bernard Shaw, the marvelous playwright and author, uh, again, uh, had a little different view of the world than, than Churchill did. And they loved needling each other, and both were quite able in that category. Uh, and one day Churchill receives a, a nice note uh, from George Bernard Shaw and he said, uh, Dear Winston, enclosed are two tickets for uh, uh, my play that opens tomorrow night. Uh, I hope you can come and, and uh, please bring a friend if you have one. Um, <laughs> Churchill immediately wrote back and returned the tickets and he said, uh, Dear George, thank you for the tickets. It was very thoughtful of you. Unfortunately, I'm obligated that evening and can't come to the opening night of your play. But I would love to, to see, uh, uh, see the play the second night, if there is one. Uh, <laughs> well, I want to sell you all something. So we'll get to this uh, a little later on, but I, I want you to keep in mind there's a purpose of the talk tonight, and it's to sell you on a, a project. And we'll talk about it. I, I was fascinated, though, to, to give you maybe set the stage a little bit to think about where we are with regard to the state of ethics and integrity in, in our country. There's a fascinating little book. Uh, as a matter of fact, Dan, uh, 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 Governor Lamb uh, brought the book to my attention when, uh, when I taught at DU uh, that wonderful year, and you were so kind to me. Um, it's by Sir John Glubb. It, it's not a particularly uh, uh, acceptable book in terms of uh, some of the things that uh, that he covers in it, uh, it now. It, it's a, a little bit out of date. But Glubb was a British general. He was a very successful British general in World War I. After the war, he uh, uh, retired. He ended up uh, training the uh, Jordanian army for a while and then um, set about to write history books. Wonderful student of history. One of the books he wrote on, it was on a subject he was fascinated with. And that's the great civilizations of mankind um, and what happens to them, and most importantly, why they decline. And he ended up with a very interesting analysis. It's pretty simple when you think about it. What he did was he, try, first of all, tried to identify the great civilizations of mankind. It's a challenge because we don't have good written records on all of them. But for the ones that you had decent rec uh, written records on and the ones that were what most people would consider the largest or most successful uh, or the most impactful. And what he did was in analyzing each one of them, he found that they went through similar stages. That is, there was a period of their immaturity, of their growth, of their formation, when they begin to grow, uh, their youth, as he called it, 
uh, a maturing youth uh, of maturity, uh, of decline. I particularly relate to that stage of life. Uh, but in their demise, as he went through. He found some interesting things. One, the average great civilization lasted about 225 years. Now, he divided the Rome, uh, Rome into two parts, the Roman Republic and the Roman Empire. I suppose you could fuss with that. But uh, on the average, they lasted about 225 years, which is a, an interesting number, particularly looking at the American history. He noticed that the stages they went through were remarkably similar similar in what happened, but mostly similar in attitudes and the way people behaved. I mean, at first you'd say, wait a minute, what do we have to do with the Greeks or the, the, the Romans or the, the, uh, the great civilizations in, uh, in Iraq, uh, uh, the, the uh, fabulous uh, Mesopotamian civilization and so on. And yet what he found and the way he writes it in the book is as civilizations went through these stages, personal attitudes and personal activities uh, seemed to change and change in unison. And you could almost identify the stage that a civilization is at by looking at the attitudes. Let me give you an example if it's helpful. Remember the wonderful tale of the Iliad and uh, uh, the heroic uh, Greeks uh, you may have other adjectives you'd throw in about the Greeks, but he would describe it as a youthful civilization, one that is on the make, one that's emerging, one that's growing, one that's expanding, all the characteristics that he would have. And if you remember, Homer in that great saga describes the attitude of how men and women interacted with each other and how they thought. Their highest value was honor, personal honor. You know, we read history books and we see people who'd kill each other over honor, and uh, we find that puzzling. Uh, it's strange at times. But what he, the point he made was that sense about honor being terribly important was a sign of a youthful, growing, dynamic civilization. And uh, he re mentions the family honor concept in Rome that was so important, the sense of integrity that was so vital uh, that they took great pride in, uh, the sense of family, all these he describes as a stage of civilization. He also describes, as other authors do, the decline of civilizations. And those of you, uh, I'm sure many of you have read uh, uh, Durant, and uh, his story of civilization. If, if sometime you have a summer, or if you're speed readers uh, a few weeks, uh, that set of books is absolutely fabulous. Um, I, I know historians sometimes uh, turn their nose up at Durant, but I, I think he does a fabulous job. But he describes the decline of the Greek civilization and the decline of the Roman civilization. And it's somewhat similar to what Glub talks about. Why do I mention all of this? One of the signs of a declining civilization is a failure of, molar, molars, uh, of morals, a decline in morals. One of the signs of a declining civilization is a failure of integrity, a movement away from personal honor, a movement away of, from honesty and integrity and in dealing with others, uh, and so on. It's a sign of a stage that every great civilization that died has gone through, and it's a sign of their dying and passing. Yet I believe is why we ought to be concerned. Because what we feel and how we act with each other and the level of integrity that we convey in our lives, in our civilization, is an integral factor, I believe, in the strength and the vitality of the American civilization and the American society and our well-being in general. Isn't that interesting that you would tie individual traits of integrity to a civilization's prosperity? And yet history seems to tell us that there's a direct link with them. I've served uh, in such luck to have an opportunity to serve in a variety of different jobs in government, uh, in private industry, uh, in some charitable works, in 
in higher education institutions the endeavors that i found the highest integrity the greatest sense of honesty the greatest devotion to treating others in an honorable way was in business and it's not close the level of integrity in american business is far higher than any of those other areas now why well there would be lots of different theories i don't think it's because good people go into business and bad people don't the reality is that there's good people who go into every area and there's people who you would not describe that way who go into every area so the raw material of humans is mixed it's not determined by who goes into the endeavor that finally sets i think the level of integrity in those areas what i think is this in business you will find that there is an enforcement level for honesty an enforcement level for fair dealing an enforcement level for integrity that doesn't exist in the other areas why pretty simple if we would buy and sell cattle uh, millions of dollars every day where your word uh, was so critical to being honored if ever you ran across someone whose word couldn't be counted on or who would mislead you in a deal it wasn't a matter of bringing a lawsuit although at times I guess that happens it was a matter that you simply never dealt with the purpose again then I know in your extensive business career you must have an a sense about this as well but often in business the enforcement mechanism was simply you chose to associate with other people and not with the ones who weren't reliable who you couldn't count on whose word wasn't good and whose memory when the deal went against them turned out to be bad it was the enforcement such an important factor I think for a civilization because if there are consequences people quickly learn to avoid those bad consequences and if we create a culture where you can lie and steal and mislead others or simply not be forthcoming and you get away with it you quickly destroy an institution or a culture itself Thomas Jefferson has a great quote that I just love many of us have heard part of it but not the more complete version Here's what Thomas Jefferson said. That government is best which governs the least. Perhaps all of us have heard that. But the quote goes on. Because its people discipline themselves. The best government is the one who governs the least because then the people must discipline themselves in their inner activities, which is precisely what happens in business and in a free market where you end up having people responding to your level of honesty and integrity and choosing the honest one. Here's a quote from Warren Buffett uh, that I, I, I just love. It, it reflects his sage view of the world. Buffett says, in evaluating people, you look for three qualities, integrity, intelligence, and energy. If you don't have the first the other two will kill you. I told you I wanted to sell you something, and I really do. I want you to think about George Washington for a minute. There's three pieces that I want to recall to your attention because I bet you all know them and are familiar with them. Three events in his life. Uh, in the French Indian War uh, in the 1750s, um, the British obviously fighting uh, the, uh, the French uh, who held Canada up until that time. The Canadians uh, and the French had gotten the Indians to be allies with them. Uh, the United States or the British colonies tried to get the Indians to ally with them too. So it wasn't just that everyone was all on one side, but thus the name, the French Indian War. Um, incidentally, it's a good sign if you get to pick the name of the war. It means you won. It's not so good if you don't. The British uh, decided to take an expedition into western Pennsylvania. Um, and uh, 
had engaged uh, some of the Virginia milit militia to join them. And uh, Washington was a colonel in the uh, Virginia militia and had volunteered to go along with him. His brother had been become a British admiral. Uh, he had hoped to become uh, an officer in the British Army, and they turned him down. Talk about bad judgment. Uh, but he led the Virginia militia along the, uh, on the uh, endeavor into the western part of Pennsylvania, which was thought to be part of the opening up of the Ohio Territory. The French had laid a trap along with their Indian allies. Washington had warned them against uh, the way the uh, British commander uh, was running the operation. They ignored his advice, blundered into, even though they had a forces bigger, bigger than the French and Indian allies combined, blundered into the French position, the Indian position, they were ambushed, uh, much of their force was wiped out. The British general is killed. Washington jumps on his horse, rallies the men, moves them back to a safe position, helps cut off divisions to come in, comes in and saves people, and provides leadership at the depth of the battle when the British forces were being destroyed and the, and the colonial forces were being destroyed, and literally saves the remnant of that army. In that process, he has several horses shot out from under him. I don't know if, how many of you have been shot at. Um, it's not as dramatic as the movies make it. They don't play music usually on the battlefield, so <laughs> it's, a, it's a more staid experience. Uh, but having a short horse shot out from under you is something of an experience. For some of us, just being on a horse is something of an experience. He has several horses shot out from under him and three bullet holes in his coat coat that he is wearing. He comes away unscathed. What I wanted to ask you to think about is what is it you do to prepare your child to show that kind of courage? What is it you do to train a friend to rush into a battle where everyone else is being killed, where you're hopelessly outnumbered, where you're being, uh, you're trapped in a crossfire and provide that kind of leadership. What is it you say to someone that says walk into certain death? And they do. Good question. Second instance in Washington's career. At the end of the war, British have uh, indicated uh, they've worked out a, a, a peace agreement or they're finalizing it in Paris, but the British are pretty well evacuating the continent. And uh, Congress is shutting down uh, much of the military. And they're shutting it down without having paid the officer corps. These are people who fought for seven or eight years, some with almost no pay at all, some without any retirement that the British officers got. And the Continental Congress is refusing to pay the officer corps the money that they acknowledge that they owe them. Now they had some problems. They didn't have the ability to tax, which obviously government has found useful. Um, the officer corps decides they're going to march on Washington. Say Washington. At the time, I think they're going to march on uh, uh, Annapolis, Maryland, where Congress was sitting. Uh, Washington, D.C., of course, wasn't built then at that time. And they're serious. They, they have fought and died and bled and been injured. They've abandoned their jobs and their businesses. Their families have been in poverty. Uh, they've not been paid what they've been promised, and they won the war. And there's no other military force in the nation. They're it. So the vast majority of the officer corps calls a meeting and s to plan their march on Congress to force them to pay what the Congress owes them. It's not a frivolous debt. It's what they owe them and they acknowledge they owe them. George Washington goes to the meeting of the officer corps and um, he gives a talk about not destroying the great gift they've given this country by this rash act. And you could tell that there's a lot of resentment. You're dealing with something these folks were promised and they've given their whole devotion and now this rotten group of politicians won't pay them what they owe. 
and at a point he's written something out and he picks it up and Washington takes out his glasses um, and puts them on kind of stumbling through it and uh, he says you know we've been at this now seven or eight years almost eight years then I have never left your side I have been with you night and day for those seven years and it was true he never left his army he never went home he never had furlough he never had leave he didn't leave the battlefield he didn't leave his troops when they retreated for places he stood with them and was the last man to leave uh, Brooklyn uh, which shows his judgment wasn't perfect um, surely you'd leave Brooklyn more quickly I've never left your side in eight years the only time he went home, incidentally, was when he was going down through Virginia um, uh, to the final battle. Uh, and he stopped at his home on his way. He said, I've never left your side. And he pulled out his glasses and put them on and he said, uh, like many of you, I have grown gray and blind in the service of our country. And the tone changed. The men he had lived with and fought with and died with for eight years began to cry. When he finished his talk, which I think is one of the most important in the history of nation, America was blessed with a tradition of civilian control over the military, even though the military has the power and maybe even a righteous cause. And what he said to them that day convinced them he said, look, I'll do everything I can to get you what you're owed. I'll be your advocate. But don't destroy the gift you've given this country and the wonderful things you've done. Third event. His army came to him when the war was over and asked him to become king of America. Now, I'm not sure how many of our presidents would have reacted. To, actually, I am sure how many of our presidents would react to that. And he turned it down. Incidentally, King George, when he was told about that, said that if, if that story is true, indeed, he is the greatest man, living man on the face of the earth. Now, I don't know if having crazy George say nice things about you is good. Actually, I don't think he was crazy at that time. It took him a while uh, for the king to, to go over the edge. Ask yourself, what is it you do to be that kind of person? Because he didn't fool anybody. This was who he was. It's how he thought. He thought about serving the country, i.e. the Cincinnati Society. Cincinnati Society was the officer corps of the Revolutionary Army. Uh, who devoted themselves to the concept of service to your country in the model of the Roman hero, Cincinnati. What is it you do to train someone to think like that? Well, with Washington, there's something interesting you can pass on. Has anybody have heard of George Washington's rules of civility? If you haven't, we'll, we'll, we'll try and get you acquainted. Washington had found an old book. It was written, I think, in a monastery in France. It was by a Jesuit priest. Uh, it went through a number of publications. But Washington adopted it, and he learned it, and he found it. He read that book, and he tried to follow it. Now, Washington grew up in a family where his parents had died off early. Uh, the wealth that the, the Washington family had later on was from his wife, not from him. Um, he, by dint of hard work, made himself what he was. But what he did was find this wonderful book and try to follow its precepts. Now, I told you I was going to sell you something. I want to sell you something. Do you remember any of those, those old commercials on television where they say you are what you eat? Uh, well, I certainly hope that's not true, uh, at, at least in my case. I hope it's not true. Woodrow Wilson wrote a book called You Are 
what you do. It, the book is called When a Man Comes to Himself. But the thesis of the book is that men and women, we are what we choose to do in life. It's not our good intentions or what we think, but we become what we do as we go through it. Here's the, here's the sales pitch. Washington made himself into the person he was. Did he have good influences? Sure. I'm sure he had some bad ones. But he set about methodically to make himself the kind of human being he thought he should be. Think about it. You can be what you want to be. You are the one that decides what you'll be like. Now, can you make yourself taller or shorter? Uh, I don't know. There's lots they do with operations these days. I don't, I don't know about that. Um, that's a little more difficult. But think about what you can do. Everyone here, from the lowest to the highest, you get to decide if you're generous. You get to decide if you're honest. You get to decide if you have integrity. You get to decide whether people rely on your word or think you're full of baloney. You get to decide whether you exaggerate the truth or whether you're strict by the truth. You get to decide whether people will think of you as dependable and honest and hardworking and productive and creative or backstabbing and nasty and unreliable. It's all for you to decide. The sales pitch I want to give you is this. We're not, you know, America only needs one George Washington. We probably filled that already. But you have an opportunity with your life to make it exactly what you want it to be. And the success or failure of that will depend on your commitment to that. Give some thought to what you want to be and what you want others to think of you. And my suggestion is that you have an opportunity to build the greatest asset on the face of the earth. And it's not a bank account, and it's not ownership of a business, and it's not ownership of jewels or gold. It's your reputation. And Linda, I believe Bill Daniels valued his reputation more than anything in the world, more than the success or failure that he had throughout his life more than anything that he had. He came to understand that that was his greatest asset. And it's why he behaved with the Utah Stars the way he did. It's why he behaved in deals and working with customers the way he did. And I think in some ways, it's why he was so successful. One quick quote. This is from Peter Bur Burwash. Your prosperity in life is dependent upon your integrity. And you're the one who gets to decide whether you have it or not and whether you'll keep it and whether you'll make it an investment of a lifetime. I'm reminded of a little story. I suspect some of you have heard it all before, but I, I love it so much. There's a story about a village where there's an old man in the village who's become thought to be wise and, and uh, creative, and it gets so that the village elders won't do anything in the village without consulting them first. And this is understandable. Some of the young people in the village are a little resentful of this, this guy. Uh, they think he's not quite what he's puffed up to be. And uh, so two young men figure out a plot to show this old guy up for what he is, the fraud that they know he is. He said, look, we're going to go around the village. We're going to gather everybody up. I'll go up to his door. I'll knock on his door, and I'll say to the old man, I have a bird in my hands. If you're so smart, tell me if the bird's alive or dead. And if he says the bird's alive, he'll, I'll crush the bird and show everybody the dead bird, and they'll know what a phony this guy is. And if he says it's dead, I'll open my hands and the bird will fly away. Perfect solution. They gather the whole village up. They gather him around his house. They go knock on the door. The old man comes to the door. And he said, old man, if you're so smart, tell me if the bird I have in my hands is alive or dead. The old man starts to answer, and then he pauses, and he looks the young man in the eye, and he says, the answer to your question is very much in your own hands. I'm convinced your reputation, your integrity, your ethics is very much in your own hands as well. And at least from here, it's in very good hands indeed. Thank you.